So it's a pleasure to have Fotis uh, Farakos uh, here to give us a seminar. Fotis is uh, an expert on supergravity. And he's a good friend uh, as well. Uh, very happy to have him here. So he will talk about anti-brain uplifts uh, and Golstino condensates. I start, right? Yeah, go on. Um, so yeah, first of all, it is a really a pleasure to, to be invited by in this uh, series of seminars, and uh, especially since there are supergravity experts in the in the in participating, I think you will uh, find some things that you might be interested in. Um, so this work we did uh, very recently with uh, Gian Guido, Maxime Emelin, and Matteo Moritu. Okay. So let me start from the motivation. First of all, we know that our universe is now uh, in, an, in a phase where uh, it is expanding. And the simplest way to describe this is if you have a background energy density that is just uh, pushing this expansion. Of course, the value of this uh, energy density is extremely small, 10 to the minus uh, 122 in uh, M-Planck units. And um, the thing we want to understand is, uh, first of all, and this expansion can be described in principle by a de-sitter phase or a quasi de -sitter. And um, that is the reason why there has been a lot of effort in embedding, embedding the sitter in string theory. The sitter is clearly from the EFT perspective easier than quasi the sitter because you just put a cosmological constant. However, um, it turns out that it is extremely hard to construct consistent the sitter vacua in a full string theory setup. And for some uh, people, this is an indication that it is actually, there is something behind this uh, difficulty. It's not that we are just finding a technical difficulty and we cannot do it. Uh, maybe there are deeper quantum gravity reasons that there does not exist uh, the sitter in any case. And we have to turn to other types of dark energy, which is not bad. It, it's, it's actually might be very good. Um, so, the, the perspective that I will give here in this seminar is that, uh, um, that, and it might turn out to be actually the case, that in general, we might be able to directly see the problems in constructing the sitter already uh, within four-dimensional uh, supergravity. But of course, by studying it in a lot of detail. Um, so, uh, the reason we might be able to see these problems in supergravity um, is because in, no matter what, no matter what happens, when you break, when you want to have um, positive energy density in, a, in an effective the field theory derived from string theory, and I'm always referring to supersymmetric string theories, so no matter what, you are going to have to break supersymmetry. Um, there is no other way that you are going to manage to do it. So this automatically means you're going to have to, 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 to have a supergravity, a four-dimensional supergravity theory with a supersymmetry breaking sector. And, um, and this is something that has not been studied uh, in detail, actually. And I believe there are a lot of uh, details there that we can understand further. Now, um, you can break, of course, supersymmetry with many ways. Here, I will focus explicitly on the breaking of supersymmetry related to nonlinear realizations. There are, of course, um, other ways to break supersymmetry that are equally interesting, but here I will focus on nonlinear supersymmetry. And the reason I will focus on nonlinear supersymmetry is twofold. First of all, we know that, uh, in principle, under general conditions, so to speak, um, a theory with broken supersymmetry uh, in the low energy will be described by nonlinear realization. So that's one. So it is the generality of nonlinear supersymmetry that it is very important. Second, um, there are some systems actually within string theory that directly have nonlinear supersymmetry. And uh, these are the systems where you include antibrains. And usually the anti-brains are introduced in the theory exactly for this purpose, 
you need something to boost the background energy and lift it to a positive value. Um, so this is the second reason that nonlinear supersymmetry is very important and we have to understand it in detail because it has actually in, uh, true um, uh, ingredients of string theory inside it. It describes true ingredients of string theory. So with these two motivations, I will uh, go di directly, first of all, be because there are a few technical passages later on, um, I want to give you directly the takeaway message, the, uh, the things that we are finding, and uh, which are a part of the, this first publication. And first of all, we, because as, the, as you know, systems with nonlinear supersymmetry are actually systems with fermions that are uh, highly nonlinear and self-interacting. Um, this means that you could have effects like uh, um, um, Goldstein or condensation, so the fermions clamp and they create condensates, like, just like in the nabuyon alazinho model, for example. And we have found that indeed this is actually the case for the volkov akulov model, so the basic uh, model of nonlinear supersymmetry. Um, this, once you couple such a system to supergravity, you find that the tachyons are still there, and this uh, in, is in agreement with earlier a bibliography on supergravity, where people were actually studying the Volkova Kulov in plus ADS supergravity, and they were again finding that the gravitino can condense and produce tachyons. And but of course, back then the interpretation was completely different. And but clearly, the result is very simple it tells you that when you have um, an, a, a, a pure anti brain in ADS, it's going to have tachyons. At least that is what these people were finding. And now we also find it from the, uh, within a supersymmetric framework, as I will show you. And this, in the end of the day, means that um, whenever you are using anti-brains to uplift your energy, you are introducing a, a potentially a, a very dangerous tachyonic instability. And uh, you can only hope that somehow magically it will be cured. Um, however, it seems to be very difficult to, 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 to stop the tachyon. Um, and this is actually that something in the string theory community people had not uh, realized until now at all. So the plan from now on is, first of all, I will give a few ingredients of nonlinear supersymmetry so that we are all on the same page. Then I will um, go through a very rough presentation of how one can handle the physics of composite states, because we want to work with uh, condensates. Um, then I will uh, sort of apply these lessons to the uh, nonlinear supersymmetry. So we will see the, how the Goldstein condensate forms. And then we will see about the consequences for uplifts. And then I will give a very short out. Um, so let me start with nonlinear supersymmetry. Um, now, to, to get us all on the same uh, pace, let me uh, introduce the chiral model here, I, the chiral multiplet. Here, I will be working only with chiral multiplets. These are um, uh, multiplets that contain the physical, all the fields that live that. Uh, close to each other under supersymmetry. So they contain a complex scale array that, it, that is physical and propagates. The vial spinor chi, which is uh, again physical and propagates. And you can see that chi transforms to the complex scalar A. And chi is a fermion. And finally, you can see that there is a, this field F, um, which uh, uh, transforms again to the fermion, however, we will see that it is not propagating. And indeed, if you write the simplest, uh, and this F is usually called uh, the auxiliary field. Now, if you write the simplest two derivative Lagrangian for a supersymmetric theory, the ingredients that you need are the so-called Keller potential K, that is a real function of A and A bar, and the W, the, the so-called superpotential, which is a function that depends only on A, not on A bar. And uh, then the bosonic sector of this 
in, so with these two functions, you can build the most general two derivative theory. And uh, of course, this, this will contain bosons and fermions. But here I'm just showing you the bosonic sector of, of such like minimal uh, Lagrangian. And you can see the, indeed it contains the kinetic terms for the complex scalars. The fields F do not propagate. You can see here that they do not have a kinetic term. They are Gaussian. And also you can see that they have linear terms um, with the derivatives of the superpotential. And this is why when you integrate out the auxiliary fields F, you get the uh, well-known expression for the scalar potential of a supersymmetric theory. Now, for our purposes here, however, what we want to do is we want to study supersymmetry breaking. And again, I will employ a chiral multiplets. I will only be working with chiral multiplets uh, in this talk. Um, so to break supersymmetry, you need to have a multiplet where the auxiliary field F gets a wave. So it, it is non-zero on the vacuum. And then the fermion, here I call it G, the fermion superpartner of F, um, on that vacuum um, transforms under supersymmetry as a shift, which means that it is the Goldstone mode of the broken supersymmetry. And uh, X here would be the complex scalar superpartner of G. However, what happens is that um, you can, so this X, G, and F combination would be a linear representation of supersymmetry. However, you can access already from this construction the nonlinear realization of supersymmetry by imposing the constraint on the scalar X that X squared is equal to zero. And if you solve that, con that constraint under the requirement that the supersymmetry transformations are self-consistent, then there is the non-trivial, obviously there is the solution that X is equal to zero, but there is the non-trivial solution that you have to impose actually when F is non-zero. And that solution is that you replace X with G square over 2F. And then when you do that, the, there is a no, no more a complex, a fundamental complex scalar in your theory. It becomes a Fermion uh, multilinear uh, on cell and uh, the Fermion, and then also the supersymmetry transformation of the Fermion bring it to uh, itself again. So supersymmetry becomes non-linearly realized. The, um, and here for purposes that you will see in a, in a moment, a, a bit later, we need, it is crucial that we can impose this uh, nil potency constraint with a Lagrange multiplier. And this Lagrange multiplier multiplet, I will call it T. So the simplest model and the first model actually that was constructed that had a nonlinear supersymmetry was the volkov akulov model. And we can, uh, we can get this model from the, the the linear realization of supersymmetry by using this nil potency constraint. And actually we can also impose this nil potency constraint um, on, the, on the linear level with the Lagrange multiplier T. So the simplest model, the volkov akulov model has only uh, XX bar as the Keller potential, has a linear term in X in the superpotential. This is required for a consistent supersymmetry breaking and also has a linear term in T, a quadratic in X in the superpotential, such that when you vary T, you get X square is equal to zero. And then happens the uh, thing I told you just now, you get the, the nonlinear supersymmetry. Um, now, when you take these ingredients, K and X, and you, add, and you put them in the Lagrangian that I saw you uh, in the start, and, and you keep now uh, all, all, all the, all, both bosons and fermions, then you start integrating out auxiliary fields and Lagrange multipliers. And in the end of the day, you will get the volkov akulov model. Here, um, and you can see that it contains only one fermion, G. And here, there is a lot of uh, physics in this very simple model. First of all, you can see that there is the, the constant term in, in the start of the Lagrangian. Um, and this acts as a cosmological constant when you couple supergravity. 
And this is exactly the term that produces the uplift in uh, all the anti-brain scenario. When you use uh, anti-brains to lift your energy, this is exactly the term that we are introducing. Um, of course, the, there is a term that contain, that describes the kinetic term of the Goldstino. So the Goldstino is a, is, a, is a field with standard kinetic terms. And then uh, equally importantly, there are higher order self interactions. And it is the physics of, the, of these self interactions that we want to study uh, further. Because um, you, you might already have the question in your mind, but we know that self-interactions sometimes lead to condensates. So why does not this happen in the Volkov Akulov? And this is the answer we want to address. So let me now go to um, a, a small review, let's say, of how we, uh, we can treat uh, composite states. Uh, clearly, if you have any questions or any comments, uh, interrupt me immediately. Um, so, the physics of composite states. Now, there are many models that are related to this. Uh, Grasnevon, Abuyon Alazinho, BCS, of course, and so on. Um, here, I will uh, follow uh, mostly the, a bit the the Nabuyon Alazinho construction, but mostly I want to, to, to uh, discuss um, what are the lessons, the rough lessons that we can learn. So you can think of the Nabuyon Alazinho model as a system where you have a, a theory with a fermion, a standard kinetic term, and then the fermion has some uh, four Fermi self interaction, which is controlled by a coupling G. And the question you want to you ask and you want to understand is, is it possible for this uh, fermion psi to develop a, a condensation? So you can to, to have psi bar psi, uh, so to have a um, background where psi bar psi has a non-zero value. So to there are various different ways to describe this of course um, here the way that I will uh, that I will uh, follow uh, because later it is very useful is with the use of a, a Lagrange multiplier Sigma so the way to do it is that you you sort of linearize if you wish this uh, for Fermi interaction and you turn it into a Yukawa coupling of a a real scalar, for example, here sigma with the with the Fermi bilinear. So, in particular, you introduce this Yukawa coupling sigma psi bar psi, and you also introduce a quadratic term in the uh, scalar sigma. And now you see what happens is that classically, when you integrate out the sigma, you get back your four Fermi interaction, and classically, this sigma corresponds to psi bar psi. And of course, indeed, classically, the value of sigma is uh, zero. And then what happens is that uh, if you um, treat the, the, this theory as a quantum theory uh, properly, then you will see, depending on, on the coupling G, um, you will see that uh, the, the field sigma can become propagating and also it can develop a non-trivial scalar potential. And then if the scalar potential has um, non-trivial critical points, then sigma will get a VEV and you will have, um, and, and actually you will be then describing a, a background where you can interpret this uh, VEV of sigma. In fact, you should interpret this VEV of sigma as the vacuum energy of, as the, condensation of the fermions. And indeed, and the important thing to remember, to, to notice here is that indeed, it is this, the propagation of sigma and the wave of sigma that are related to the composite states. So probably you already see where this is going because I, we already have, a, a, we have this Lagrange multiplier sigma. And in the end of the day, we want to do something similar for the Lagrange multiplier T that we introduced for the Volkov-Akulov. 
Now, however, before I go back to supersymmetry, let me uh, give a few more ingredients. As I said, we need to think of the, of, to, it is the quantum effects that introduce a kinetic term for sigma and give it a potential. Uh, actually, they, they, they might change its potential. And the way we treat this quantum effects is that is the following. Um, I mean, this is not up to, uh, I mean, people know this is in the bibliography, this is well studied. Um, one way to do it is that because in any case, these four Fermi theories and effective theory, so it's defined with a cutoff. Um, you can do a Wilsonian approach where you start with a cutoff lambda and you lower your cutoff to a cutoff to lambda prime. And the important thing is that if you do this uh, procedure non perturbatively, you are going to capture all the effects of the high momenta that you integrate it out. So you, you really remove all, all the high momenta modes. And this forces the theory actually to give you new um, three level, if you wish, interactions that you have to add into your uh, new effective Lagrangian, which capture all the effects of all the modes that you have removed. This is the Wilsonian approach. So indeed uh, here, what we, want, we would want to do is we just want to lower the cutoff of this uh, theory, of this uh, simple model, where we just have this uh, scalar sigma and the Yukawa coupling. And indeed you can direct, you already, uh, if you open any field theory book, you immediately find that such a Yukawa coupling automatically will introduce through the fermion uh, one loop, so through the psi loops, will automatically introduce a kinetic term for sigma. And this kinetic term will have, uh, in this perturbative uh, uh, thing, will just have the, will be the, uh, the logarithm of uh, the two cutoffs. So logarithm of lambda over lambda prime. So you see that um, when lambda prime is equal to lambda, so when you did not integrate out anything yet, sigma is not propagating because the kinetic term becomes zero and you are back into your um, starting theory where sigma is a Lagrange multiplier. When you lower the cutoff, sigma picks up a, kin a kinetic term and in principle it might get also non-trivial potential and then the physics of the Nabuyan Alazinian model happens. Um, however, and uh, we know that in the Nabuyan Alazinian model, for example, we usually talk about the large N expansion. This is because it allows you to control the uh, loop diagrams. For our purposes, we do not have a large N because the, the volkov akulov model has only one fermion inside. So we have to do this procedure uh, in a, directly in a non-perturbative way so that we don't need to find uh, extra physical uh, arguments that help us control the uh, loop expansion. So actually we do not want to do a loop expansion. So the way to do a uh, Wilsonian uh, uh, flow in a non-perturbative way is to use, well, one of the ways to do it is to use the functional renormalization group flow. And the way this works here, of course, I will be very, um, very, very sketchy, just to give you, to give you the, a taste of how things work. And we start with the, with the directly with the Euclidean partition function. And this, uh, this uh, of course, contains a cutoff nu, which helps us regular, re, uh, regularize various uh, integrals. So you can think of this as an effective theory with a cutoff nu. And uh, what you have to do, the, the, how the, the, um, the, the exact uh, RG flow works in the way that Poczynski um, uh, reformulated is that you split your action into the propagator piece and into the interaction piece. Here it is still an action, but I just call it L following uh, Poczynski's notation. Um, you, you, you split it into the propagator piece and into the interaction piece. So from all your uh, action, you take a pass, a, a part uh, that has the kinetic terms. You go to momenta to Euclidean space and so on. And then you take 
a part that has the kinetic terms and you call it propagator piece. As you can see here, there's the P square, but, and, but you use the, uh, you, you introduce the regulator there. The regulator is this C. And of course the regulator depends on the momenta and on the cutoff, obviously. And its job, the job of C is that uh, when you do your um, integrals, it, it always cuts off the integrals so that they don't blow up. This is all the point of introducing the regulator in your effective theory. And, uh, and of course the rest is the interactions, which are um, generically or all sorts of interactions that you can imagine that are allowed of course by your symmetries. You can have, for example, you have a couplings and of course you can keep track of the wave function renormalization. And the form of the regulator, you can, in your mind, you can picture it, this C, um, it's, it's dependence of P, on P square over mu square. You can uh, picture it like in the form that I saw in the bottom of the slide is this red line, but also, and it, it, in principle, it, it is good for it to be an, an analytic uh, function. Uh, so this means automatically that it's gonna be smooth and so on. But um, in simple applications, it is also useful to use a, a more um, a non-analytic function where you see we, it is multiplied with a, a step function here. And actually this C uh, is sometimes called a optimized uh, regulator and it is the one that I will be using here. Now, then the, the way that the, that the exact uh, RG flow works after you, so this is here we were setting up everything and now we want to derive the RG flow. The way that we do it is that um, one asks of course that the path integral is independent of the uh, regularization scale because your results cannot depend on the cutoff. So you, you actually just uh, ask that the derivative of the path integral with respect to the cutoff mu is zero. It's, it's uh, simple as that. And then Polsinski showed that um, one way to uh, satisfy this condition, here actually we are doing, in principle, we are always doing the logarithmic derivative, the, the derivative with the logarithm of, of mu traditionally. And the, the logarithm of mu is the RG time in principle. Um, Polsinski showed that if you want your uh, path integral to satisfy this condition, you can, um, you can indeed uh, do it by if your, um, if your acts, if your if the interaction piece of your action satisfies um, the this equation that you can see here in the middle of the slide, which is sometimes referred to as the sometimes you might see it as the Polchinski equation. It's this equation here. So you can see the the L dot. So the the um, the derivative with respect to the RG uh, scale or the RG time is equal to, on the right hand side, is sourced by the, um, the quadrat, the, the second derivative of the interaction piece plus the first derivative squared, if you have a scalar. But you could have also fermions and so on. Um, in principle also for fermions, you have a similar uh, um, uh, form of the, of the terms. And because this is already two, two hand, two, to um, general, um, you can already see how nicely this works. Um, imagine you have a scalar field theory for now, and this, this scalar might have an interaction piece that has a phi to the third, so y3 times phi to the third, y4 times phi to the four, and y6 times phi, times phi to the six. And this would be in your interaction piece. So some scalar with self interactions. And uh, let's say you want to find the, the flow equations of the y to the four coupling. So the coupling that controls the phi to the four interaction. Then what you have to do is you, you have to introduce this L int into the Polchinski equation. So on the left-hand side, 
you would have the dot hitting on the Y4. So that's why you, you would get Y4 dot. And on the right hand side, you would have to find all the terms that would be, um, that would contain phi to the four. So this would be terms that come from the second derivative of the interaction Lagrangian with respect to uh, phi. So this would be actually the phi to the six terms. When you take the second derivative, it becomes phi to the four, or it would be the first derivatives of the phi to the third square. And this is in the end, uh, how you get the flow equation for the y to the four. And you get that y to the four dot is uh, proportional to y to the six plus y to the three square. And of course, um, if you had other terms, they could also contribute. And in the end of the day, you have to include all the terms that contribute to the RG flow. So you, you will get a bunch of equations because of this. Uh, in principle, actually, you will get uh, infinite terms. And that is the real problem of this uh, approach. Um, of course, uh, of course, such a problem would exist um, because you are doing something that is fully non-perturbatively. So um, of course, it's going to have some, somewhere there's going to be a catch. Um, and notice that if you, if you imagine this, how it is diagrammatically, you can automatically see that this is not a loop expansion. So we are not doing a loop, loop expansion here. Um, so now- There's just one uh, question. Yes, yes. Yeah, it looked like you were uh, uh, neglecting some terms in the derivative of uh, the interacting uh, Lagrangian, this plus other uh, uh, prop. What are yes. these terms? Um, these terms is um, here. Uh, this would be the contribution to the flow. If you had, let's say, only a scalar phi or a bunch of scalars phi alpha. For example, if you had fermions, you, of course, you would need to introduce uh, other terms of this type that would uh, correspond to your fermions. So for example, um, a, a second derivative with respect to the fermions plus first derivatives of the fermions square and so on. It, um, so it depends on the matter content of your, on your, the, of your theory that you will need to change this thing. This is only for a scalar here. The, these are the other terms. Okay. Um, so uh, let me go to, so now we want to sort of apply this um, lessons to the, finally, to the Volkova Kulov model. Um, now, as I already said, the exact renormalization group flow becomes very complicated very fast. And people, uh, one of the challenges is to control this infinite uh, set of equations that you will get. And people are always searching for approximations. And an approximation that works very well is the so-called local potential approximation, where um, what you do is that in the scalar field theory, you go into the interaction piece and you truncate all the terms that are derivatives. And then indeed, uh, it gives quite a good uh, results. And this is still only for theories that include only scalars. If you, as soon as you start to include fermions, uh, it becomes very hard, uh, very difficult to handle the, the thing. However, uh, in supersymmetry, uh, this local potential approximation is uh, it's not enough and you are, it, 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 it is illegal in, in a sense because super, the supersymmetry transformation contain derivatives and if you, if you start truncating derivatives, derivative interactions by hand, you are automatically breaking supersymmetry because terms without derivatives and terms with derivatives are uh, related, are belong to the same supersymmetric Lagrangian. So you cannot directly just go and use a local potential approximation. And the, the simplest thing that uh, we uh, decided to do and with that we thought of doing is to, uh, instead of truncating uh, derivatives, uh, 
truncate all the terms in this flow that are not described by Keller potential and the superpotential. So in this way, we keep some of the two derivative terms, some derivative interactions, but of course, always up to two derivatives. But we keep only the ones that are uh, uh, related, that are uh, due to the Keller potential. So in this way, um, we remain manifestly supersymmetric at, at any step. And the terms that we are ignoring are always higher derivatives. And we, we call this supersymmetric local potential approximation. And now the idea is that we want to finally apply uh, this uh, supersymmetric local potential approximation, which I will show you in a moment how it works, to the volkov akulov model, because we, we know now how to recast the volkov akulov model into a form where it is described by a Keller potential and a superpotential. And of course, um, as you imagine, we have the Lagrange multiplier T. So if there are composite states, this T will become propagated. Um, so indeed, this is the, the, the thing we want to understand. Does the Lagrange multiplier T pick up a kinetic term? So um, you, you might remember the superpotential that I showed you in the start. It is actually the, this here. And T, uh, in the volkov akulov model does not have a kinetic term. It is just a Lagrange multiplier. Now, here, we want to do the same procedure for the volkov akulov model. And of course, you know that the kinetic terms of a supersymmetric system are, are described by the Keller potential, by the quadratic piece of the Keller potential. So, the pro so we take the Keller potential and the superpotential of the volkov akulov model, and we split the Keller potential into two parts, one of them is the propagator piece and the other is the interaction piece. And we regula regular, uh, introduce the regulators in the propagator piece. The same regulators as before, this C. Because this C actually uh, depended only on the momenta, um, it is also automatically uh, a supersymmetric regulator. Uh, this is indeed, in fact, also one of the open problems in supergravity. Um, how to do this in a full supergravity setup. Um, now, so now we have the propagator piece and the interaction piece. Um, in the interaction piece for the Keller potential, I have introduced also the um, alpha and the beta, which parameterize are the wave function renormalizations of the X and the T superfields. And of course, um, there might be uh, because of the flow, higher order um, terms in the Keller potential might be generated, which I will show you momentarily. And um, we have checked that the superpotential, of course, you know that the superpotential does not renormalize, and, but we have also checked that the superpotential indeed does not change through the flow. So we keep the, the full superpotential is just the interacting superpotential. Sorry for this, just uh, probably a yes. stupid question, but. In the K propagating part, uh, why the C minus one functions are the same? Should it be yeah. different? Uh, because I mean, uh, I, I expect yeah. that uh, uh, when you get to the scale uh, uh, of the original the scale, of, uh, yeah, the, the second term should disappear. Yes, um, yes. Uh, actually, what you are saying is happens in the interaction piece. In the, this beta should disappear. The alpha and beta are different because alpha and beta are the wave function renormalizations. These are the ones that you are referring to. So indeed, beta disappears in the start. But the propagator piece um, is independent of this. Is the propagator piece is just uh, tells you how to do your loops and how to, to regularize them. The, the compositeness condition is applied on, on the beta. It is a bit in the start, I, I agree. It is, it is a, it seems like we are putting a kinetic term by hand, but we are not because when Vita becomes zero, um, you see that this minus one exactly cancels the C to the minus this C because the C for zero momenta is a unit. You, you see this cancellation, right? The minus one cancels this C. If you think of adding, the propagator piece and the interaction piece, 
the c to the minus one will cancel with the unit. So, so and you also proved that uh, no renormalization of the superpotential. Uh, yes, and non perturbatively Yes, at least at least within our approximation, it is very uh, fast to show that the superpotential does not receive any corrections. Yes. Um, so then, um, within this SLPA approximation, and using the regulator, uh, the, the form of C that I showed you before, actually, let, let me remind you, this is the C that we are using. So you see that when the momenta is zero, uh, or if you wish, if you ignore the higher order derivative terms, C becomes a unit. And this is exactly why this unit here will cancel the minus one from here, you see? And the only TT bar term in your uh, d4 theta integral will be the Vita. You see, so when Vita is zero, you don't have any kinetic terms. Now, with, when you do this uh, procedure, this SLPA as I call it, I will not go through the details. Um, for a theory with the Keller potential and the super potential, you find that it takes exactly uh, the form that you can see in the bottom of the slide. So the, the, the RG time derivative of the, of the Keller potential is sourced by two terms. Um, the first term is the second derivative of the superpotential squared. And the second term is the second derivative of the Keller potential of the interacting piece of the Keller potential itself. Um, if you include all the higher derivative terms, you would get infinite terms, of course, right? This is a truncation. And this truncation does not take into account the back reaction of the, the possible back reaction of the higher derivative terms on the Keller potential. Um, this is indeed an approximation. Uh, this is one of the things we are trying to understand now, how to improve this. Um, so with all this uh, now uh, ready, we plug in the full K and W into the uh, uh, flow equation. And in order to, to solve this, this equation here, we need, of course, we might need in principle to introduce higher order terms and new terms in the Keller potential. And indeed, it turns out that uh, we are lucky enough that actually we don't need infinite terms. We just need to introduce only two new terms in the Keller potential. And these are higher order um, interactions with four uh, superfields. So there's a T square, T, T bar, X, X bar, higher order term, and then uh, X square, X bar square, higher order term. And uh, this is the full uh, result for the Keller potential now. So I, I, I put all the pieces together again um, when you do the, the SLPA. And actually, from the SLPA, you get the flow equations for the uh, wave function renormalizations, alpha and beta, and for the higher order terms, G and Q. And indeed, the important thing is that uh, if you write the flow equations, the solution of the flow equations in terms of the RG time, so the RG time is this T and it, it is the logarithmic, um, it, it is a logarithm of lambda over lambda prime. So lambda is your starting uh, cutoff. Lambda prime is your new cutoff. So you just lower your cutoff by a bit. So the RG time is very small here. And you see that indeed, um, when you solve the, the RG flow equations, you will find that um, alpha is still remaining around, remaining around unit because indeed is the, is the, is the wave function renormalization of the X multiplet, but Vita indeed becomes zero at the start of the flow. And this is the compositeness, uh, some people, time people uh, refer to it as the compositeness condition. So this is the guy that actually becomes zero. So indeed, the kinetic term for T does become zero. And, but then it turns out that it grows. Notice that it is positive. Vita is positive, so it is not a ghost. And you also get um, some extra higher order terms. Um, the, the big result here, and actually it was very unexpected, unexpected for us in the start, is that if you analyze, first of all, you expect that 
um, when t and x is equal to zero, this actually corresponds to the uh, Volkova Kulov model. Because indeed, when you put t and x equal to zero, the vacuum energy is just uh, f squared. And it corresponds to a situation where um, the condensates have not formed. However, if you, if you analyze the mass matrix for the scalars around that critical point, uh, and these scalars are now both the scalars, the scalar x and the scalar t, because t also now is propagating and has a non-trivial uh, scalar potential, you find that uh, there are always negative um, eigenvalues for the mass matrix. And this automatically means that there are tachyons. So what happens is that the self-interactions of the Volkov-Akulov uh, prefer to, to generate a composite uh, bosonic states and, and actually lower their energy. This is very similar to what happens in the nabuyon alazinho model. And of course, this is something actually uh, completely new. And if you want to uh, think of what are these composite states that we are talking about here, um, as, I, as, as we said before about the sigma, you can imagine them to correspond to the classical values of x and t. And um, the va classical value of x, of course, these are, x and t are both multi multilinear in the fermions, but the first, the, the leading order terms for x are g squared, and for t are derivatives of g squared. Uh, actually, there is an ambiguity in the, def in the, in the properties of t, and uh, uh, Sergei was one, actually was the first uh, person to point this out. And um, uh, indeed, we, we, we also comment on that. There is an ambiguity uh, in, in the value, in the classical value of t, because you can shift it with x. Now, um, what does all mean now? We understood these new properties of the volkov akulov model. And uh, now let's see what does this all mean for, uh, what, are, what are the implications now for uh, supergravity and string theory? So for uplifts, because typically we use the volkov akulov model to lift the vacuum energy. Now, um, we, can, we know that we can couple the volkov akulov model to supergravity. Um, people know how to do this for a long time. Um, in 4D, now I'm talking about four-dimensional n equal long supergravity. So you take ADS supergravity and you just introduce the volkov akulov model and you can automatically get the sitter. Um, and the idea is we, we want to understand uh, how the, if there are condensates there and how they behave. Now, first of all, uh, at this point, because we, uh, there are many open problems of doing the exact RG flow within four-dimensional n equal one supergravity. So even, even the simplest thing is not known how to do. And as far as I understand, the, the, the point, the problem is uh, already understanding how to introduce properly the regulator. Um, this automatically means that we, we are not able yet uh, to do the exact RG flow within supergravity. But um, I just just understand. So is a technical yes. problem uh, related to finding problem, uh, yes. manifest? I mean, to keeping manifest yes. supersymmetry in yes. the procedure, or uh, yes. I mean, could if, could you just try to do it uh, uh, starting yes. with the uh, on shell sugra? I mean, exact normalization. Um, oh. So did Don't they study the uh, fermions in these procedures uh, coupled to gravity or? In the on, on cell, I, as you see, we are doing- I mean, even without cells. supersymmetry, I was uh, wondering where, where, whether- Oof, uh, I don't know, especially without supersymmetry. I, 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 without supersymmetry, maybe people are doing things, yes. But the problem is that as soon as you go in supergravity, right? Uh, you need to have uh, uh, procedures that preserve supersymmetry at every step. And the, of course, here we are always off cell. And so you need to find the proper way to uh, 
embed this C, the regulator, in a 4D n equal one theory. And then the rest you can do, but uh, you have to do it uh, properly because you see this C uh, um, it depends on the momentum. Of course, for n equal one, you just put derivatives, right? You know that it this works, but in supergravity, uh, just putting derivatives is not enough. It's not a uh, super symmetric. So this is an actually uh, something that it, it is important to, to, to answer. And, and if we answer this uh, technical problem, we can uh, do, uh, we can find then in, in interesting results that are important for, for string theory. Sorry, sorry, one more question. What is, yes. uh, how do you do uh, this uh, all momentum cutoffs in, in curl space? Ah, uh, yes, and that's what I'm saying. I, I don't exactly know how the point, do. yeah? Yes, that's the, that's all the point, yes. Yeah. This is an actually big problem and very important problem for, and I mean, the super graph people have to at some point uh, figure this out. Indeed, that's what I'm saying. We don't know how to do it. Um, so what we do instead is we say, okay, uh, the super gravity corrections in some limit are going to be small. Um, so in principle, one would expect that um, the, the Keller potential and the superpotential for the Volkova Kulov model that describe the composite states will more, might possibly capture the leading order terms of the theory. Uh, and then the supergravity corrections might be smaller. However, very important for, the phys for other physical applications, but maybe for the study of vacuum stability. So exactly the critical point, um, the supergravity corrections might actually not change so much the behavior. And uh, for this reason, we said, okay, as a first test to see what happens, we just take the Keller potential that we derived from supersymmetry and the superpotential. So this Keller potential and this superpotential, and we just throw them into the supergravity theory. So usually, when you do the Volk when you do the Volkova Kulov model in supergravity, you have only the x x bar term and the linear term in, uh, in x. Forget for the moment the gravity no uh, mass term. And now we just take we just introduce we say okay in principle we 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 know that the x x bar term actually through the RG flow will give rise to all the other terms in the Keller potential. So now we just couple this to supergravity. And what we find is that um, the tachyons persist. So when you couple the Volkova Kulov model to supergravity, you treat it in this way. Um, in principle, uh, we expect that, the, again, the same tachyons that you find in global supersymmetry are going to be there. And uh, at some point, when we were finding this, this strange res result, we realized that actually this was something that was already known in the supergravity community that you might have a uh, tachyons when you couple the Volkova Kulov model to supergravity, but it was studied in the form of gravity in condensates. And if you open the papers on the, even the early papers and later the papers on gravity in condensation in 4D n equal one, you are going to see that there is always a tachyon on the top of the, of the potential. But people then studied other applications and they never appreciated that this is actually a, a very catastrophic result for all the anti-brain uplifts in KKLT and LDS and so on. So this was really an ignored result. Here we do it in a manifestly supersymmetric way. And indeed we seem to agree, we agree in principle with the uh, earlier bibliography. Um, Gabriele, if I'm going out of time, tell me please. Yeah, I think I'm, uh, I'm going uh, very slow. Okay, uh, I, I'll, start, I'll start to wrap up. Um, so, uh, as, as you know, we can, uh, um, the same situation holds for KKLT. For KKLT, we use an important superfield X and we put some other superfields that uh, describe the uh, other moduli of the theory. The simplest setup is to have a single Keller modulus uh, that I call here S. So typically in the KKLT, your Keller potential will have the form that I saw here minus three the logarithm of s plus s bar plus xx bar. 
And again, because we have no way of doing this full calculation within 4D n equal one supergravity, what we did is we just replaced XX bar with the effective description for the composite states. And again, we find that there is, it's full of tachyons again, and this would happen. Um, so even if you trust KKLT and you say it's totally solid, I mean, all the, all the parameters as they, as they are and so on, uh, actually there are, uh, the supergravity tells you that that's not true, that it, it's full of tachyons. So um, this uh, result you can already see in the supergravity level. And uh, interestingly enough, this result, it, it is not what we were searching for. We, we, we were thinking that there is no way there's any stability there, everything will be stable. However, um, this might be actually a supergravity itself giving you uh, um, all this, uh, giving you directly access to all, to all these uh, the sitter conjectures that claim that there is no the sitter and so on, or that the sitter is tachyonic. Um, again, very important message here is that we, we don't know how to do this calculation directly in supergravity and it would be great if we have the tools to do them. So as an outlook, um, first of all, again, the takeaway message, um, the, we are finding that there is a nonlinear, um, the nonlinear supersymmetry might have tachyonic instabilities. These instabilities, I call them instability because I'm only working around the critical point that would correspond to the Volkov Akulov. This actually might be, uh, there might be very interesting and important physics hidden here because maybe there is another critical point further away um, and that would contain a lot of physics and and, or you might want to study uh, other dynamics like inflation and so on. So um, this is not a bad thing that there is an instability. It, there, it, might, it means that there is possibly other physics that, we are, uh, that have been ignored in, until now. Indeed, this resonates with all the bibliography. Our findings for the uh, Goldstino resonate with all the bibliography related to the Gravitino condensation because indeed in supergravity, the Gravitino, the Goldstino is a part of the Gravitino. So clearly it had too much. And finally, our results show that there is um, a very big and unknown and ignored problem in all the anti-brain uplifts, including KKLT, LVS, or any uh, other uh, things that people are trying to do. And the only hope is that somehow, if you really want to get the sitter, you have to, and if you want to get the sitter with antibrains, you really have to uh, find a way to stabilize all these runaway directions, uh, touch the touch And um, I already told you a few things that we want to do next. And I believe that, and some of them I think are really important and indeed is an opportunity for the supergravity uh, community to attack these problems. Um, here, what we are trying to do uh, we're trying to do the simplest thing possible, which is just in the supersymmetric case, go beyond the SLPA. So go beyond our approximation. And uh, this is important because clearly it will give us a much better control of the uh, results of the ERG flow. And in, it will also give us access to larger RG times because um, this, this SLPA results are very solid for small RG times, but uh, we believe that they might change for ra ra larger renormalization group times. This does not mean that the tachyons are not there, but it might give access to, to other physics as well. Um, however, um, and they did, we might understand in this way, does the tachyon stop somewhere? Are there other critical points? Is there a supersymmetric vacuum, not a supersymmetric vacuum? Um, clearly, uh, a, a next step is to do, to understand what happens when you include matter couplings and other nonlinear fields. Um, as I stressed many times, um, it's, it, it would be great if we have a way to go beyond, uh, to understand actually how to do, how to, how to handle the regulator, this C, Within a 4D n equal one supergravity, this would, this would give access to uh, a lot of uh, uh, new results. Um, clearly, we want to understand what are these tachyons in a string theory setup. This, of course, further something 
quite a few steps further from now. Uh, this might be either an open string sector or closed string sector, we do not know. And finally, here I, I, have, been, I have been concentrating only on n equal one. Um, it is important to understand what happens when we go beyond n equal one. I mean, we know that we have a constrained superfields and nilpotent superfields uh, and nonlinear supersymmetry, even in n equal two, for example. Um, so it might be important to understand what happens. Uh, it is actually very important to understand what happens there. Uh, thank you. Okay, I went a bit over time. Well, thanks a lot for this. This was a very nice talk. There are questions from the audience. Oh, can I ask one question? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for this. It was a good talk. Uh, uh, just very naive question. Uh, well, supergravity, well, we always think of supergravity as an effective theory. And Volkov yes. Akulov is an effective theory. And still, you are trying to uh, quantize, sort of just, you are trying to do quantum theory with Volkov Akulov. Uh, and is it, and, and, you, uh, and you face problems? Uh, yes. Uh, perhaps is it could it be that uh, setup should be changed? That it's. I mean, what's point to quantize effective theory? Maybe you you uh, yes, you are you you should always quantize even if it is an effective theory. The, it's you have to do it in any case. That's the point. You that's why you we use the Wilsonian approach in any case, even the effective theory. If, I mean, if you give me an effective theory and you tell me this is the effective theory, I give it to you with a cutoff. Now take it and do whatever you want with it. Um, obviously, I am allowed to, to treat it quantum mechanically. Um, uh, it, but of course, I'm not going to treat it as if it is renormalizable or, or a finite theory. I will treat it as an effective theory. So in the Wilsonian approach, that, that's exactly what we are doing here. Here, uh, we are not saying that, you know, um, it is a renormalizable or something. We just treat it as an effect, quantum mechanically as an effective theory. But you, you don't quantize effective action. I mean, so when you when you just consider field theory, say QD, you just yes. uh, you, you do quantum theory, you, you compute effective action, and you don't quantize effective action. You you essentially you think of it uh, uh, as uh, well, what you can do with it is just um, three level manipulations, because effective action already has information about scattering. Yes, 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 the, the, okay. Um, here, the, the, I understand. Here, the starting point is not the effective action. I don't, I do not consider the Volkov Akulov to be a, what, the quantum effective action. Let's say it like this. I just consider that the Lagrangian for the Volkov Akulov is a, is a three-level Lagrangian um, that I think of as an effective theory, not as a quantum effective action. So it's not a quantum effective action, the work of Akul. Of course, then you don't requantize it again, obviously. I treat it as, as an effective Lagrangian. And then um, clearly I'm allowed to study the RG flow and everything. Yes, that you are allowed to quantize. The effective, it is effective field theory with the cutoff. And that you are allowed to treat you should actually treat it quantum mechanically. And, and then when you do it, you get the effective action, of course. Um, I, I, but indeed, if you say the Volkov Akulov is the quantum effective action, uh, yeah. Um, but I think it's just, it's just an effective theory, that's all. It's, all right. an, it's an effective theory. Uh, I have one more question. Uh, yes. is there a, any results about n equal three model? I uh, no n equal three no even n equal two is a, even n equal we are now we are doing n equal one in supersymmetry so the, the simplest possible thing is already hard I uh, n equal I mean n, why n equal three I mean, n, I, even n equal two I think it's uh, already no n equal n equals two uh, is great and and there may be some non non renormalization theorems to help ah. In n equal three, you mean? 
No, no, uh, n equals two. I mean. Ah, n, n equals two. Yes. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Um, uh, I wonder how the uh, how how it will be in n equal to, but it is not. I mean, you can only you know imagine the results. I mean, we know that there are Lagrange multipliers. Actually, I was looking at your papers a few days ago, and I know there are we know there are Lagrange multipliers to, that impose an hypothesis, but um, still you have to go and full do the full RD flow in n equal to. Mm -hmm. It takes work. It takes effort to do. It, it might be that you might not get actions. That could be really interesting if for some reason n equal to you don't get tachyons um but i don't know who, how it will work all right thank you Kofotis. any questions maybe i have two questions one is a uh, I mean, how bad are this tachyonist instability i mean oh, uh, very bad yeah, they are very yeah, that's bad. the main point, right? Because one thing is, uh, I mean, the, the fact that you find tokenist instability, okay, but uh, the most important thing is uh, to see how bad they are. So, yeah, yeah are, whether this is some type of vacuum that will collapse immediately or uh, it's long lived, right? So, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, for the moment, they are very bad. It seems that it just collapses uh, immediately. However, we want to see what happens when you go to large RG time. Um, maybe some tachyons become milder, but when you, if, if you say, okay, I lower the cutoff only a bit, then the tachyons are uh, really huge, very catastrophic. And if you want to see how the tachyons are, um, just look at the superpotential. You see it is a Tx square, right? So then, um, this X, one of the X's you can imagine that it gets the VEV because it is the auxiliary field that gets a VEV. So the tachyons are actually in your scalar potential uh, T times X. They are due to off diagonal terms between T and X. These are the tachyons that dominate. Yeah, the second question is, uh, I mean, I, I probably there is, uh, it, it might be naive, very naive or uh, there is no clear answer, but uh, so, Fun comment was that uh, the, the whole analysis that you did was uh, essentially uh, on Susie breaking in uh, Minkowski space, right? Yeah. So I was wondering uh, whether something similar can be done, uh, not in full sugra, but uh, in uh, starting from ideas, because this is uh, actually the, the setup that uh, would be appropriate for KKLT, right? And then uh, uh, you have another uh, uh, physical, I mean, you have another scale in the problem. And, and I was wondering yeah. if this is actually changing somehow the uh, renormalization uh, mm. that you get, and uh, mm. so uh, may, I mean, at the supersymmetric level, you, you, uh, you, you might have, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it might still be complicated, but I was wondering whether even uh, in to the non supersymmetric in supergravity in some sense. So, I, I uh, not, not even in supergravity, just uh, uh, QFT mm. in ADS, and uh, maybe yeah. even without supersymmetry. Do you see? Ah, without, yeah, I mean, I don't know if it, there is, it will be very results. hard because. Actually, the only reason that these, these calculations are tractable is because of supersymmetry. Otherwise, it's, it's going to be a mess. It's, it's very hard to do it. You, if, you don't preserve super, if you don't preserve supersymmetry of cell, it becomes very hard. The only reason that we, were, we managed to, to go through this is be exactly because uh, there was supersymmetry all the way. But it would be indeed interesting to, if it is possible to, to couple to have some uh, ADS, uh, supersymmetry ADS, let's say on some fixed supergravity background, and even there couple the Volkova Kulov, um, so that it is like semi-global, let's say. Yeah, indeed, that it would be really interesting to see what happens there. It might be uh, closer to the supergravity calculation, actually, I agree. It, it would be really interesting calculation. Because I mean, in the KKLT, you are starting with a yeah, huge ADS exactly. uh, scale and yes. you had a huge uh, uh, positive vacuum yeah, energy yeah. to get yes. the small one, right? So there is a huge yeah. compensation of scales uh, in uh, the problem, yes. which here yeah. you are completely neglecting here because you start yes. uh, directly with an analysis in uh, Minkowski. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm completely with you on this. I totally agree. And actually, 
uh, even so if you start from ads and you have a way to write down your your supersymmetric theory in this ads background so you capture some effects of the supergravity back reaction and you do the flow there um, you don't need to completely raise your put a small uh, Susie breaking scalar even if you remain in ads that's very interesting um, and you but still put the Volkov Akulov and you are able to, 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 to go through these calculations, it will be great. If it can be done, it will be really, it will be really great. Uh, 